So I'm Marcus, and I'm really, really, really excited to be with you all today. Um, as Dan mentioned, I, I, I have my feet in two different worlds as a practitioner at Wyden Kennedy, but also as an academic at the University of Michigan. And the way I see my job is really kind of bridging the academic practitioner gap, bringing these two worlds, these two worlds together. Uh, and while I'm very proud of those things, the thing I'm most proud of are these two little girls, Georgia and Ivy. And, and, I, and I bring them up because I talk about them all the time, but specifically, so it sets up what I want to talk to you about today. And it's about perspective. And boy, do I love that quote. Wow, big data is generally correct, but specifically flawed. I mean, so perfect. And I'm going to talk to you today about perspective with regards to people. Seems kind of big, seems kind of uh, 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 abstract in some ways, but it's very, very specific. And what I found is that things aren't the way they are. Things are the way that we are. Right? That is, the way we see the world governs how we behave in the world. And if we can see the world differently, then the world will manifest differently. Here's an example. So this is me and uh, my daughter, Georgia, when she was just, just, just a baby. I took her to the pool, did one of these numbers. Check it out. Boom. I throw in the air. Perfect air time, by the way. Look at that. Perfect air time. I catch her. Boom. Great dad. That's me. All right. So... Here's how I saw that situation. I threw Georgia in the air just a little bit, nothing to be alarmed about. Georgia saw it, maybe I threw her a little bit higher. But my wife, Marcus! <laughs> you want to kill our, our kid, right? This is all a matter of perspective. Things aren't the way they are. Things are the way that we are. Now, look, we're all marketers here, except for one. Hi. Welcome. We got to have you with us. We're all marketers. So we have a perspective about marketing. And what people say about marketing is that marketers understand consumers as the real life human beings that consumers are. They're not machines that eat messages and crap cash. They're human beings. So we understand all these intricacies, which by the way, is a superpower for us. I mean, we should be able to pat each other on the back because we're all marketers here, except one, but you're part of us now. We're all marketers. So we can say, look, that's great that we can understand people with all the dimension that they have. I mean, even Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is an astrophysicist says that, look, in science, when human behavior is into the equation, uh, things go nonlinear. That's why physics is easy and sociality is hard, right? Because people are complex. We are some complicated mofos, right? Even Sir Isaac Newton said, I can calculate the motions of heavenly bodies, but not the madness of people. But us marketers, oh, we know people so well. We know people so well that we're able to tap into all the things that make them move, telling stories to get those people to, to adopt behavior. But most mere mortals, they can't do that very well. And because people are so complicated, regular folks just put people in boxes, boxes that are easy, that are simple, that are discreet, but not us marketers, right? For instance, like uh, meet my friend, Deborah. Deborah drives a minivan. Does Deborah have kids? Yes. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, do our kids play a sport? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what sport do they play? Soccer. Okay, okay, okay. And, uh, and, and where does Deborah live? Now, I gave you one data point about Deborah. You mapped out her entire life. This is what we do. Not because it's accurate, but because it's easy. And while we think of ourselves as marketers, we know people so well, we do not. We actually suck at it. I just met you all today and you all in unison said the exact same thing. And we do this all the time. In fact, we, ha we have an instrument that we use to do this so well called demographics. Age, race, gender, household income, education. We put people in these boxes based on the memory structures we have associated with these demographies, not because they're real, but because they're easy. Take for instance my demographics. I'm 43 years old. I'm African American. If you had noticed, uh, the mass may have blocked it. I'm from Detroit, born and raised, holla. And went to public schools my entire life. Now, if a marketer saw that on a brief, they go, oh, he must walk like this, talk like this, go to those places, do those things, because that's just what black people do. And it sounds completely racist when I say this out loud, but this is what we do all the time. Deborah has a minivan, so she definitely has kids who play soccer and they live on a cul-de-sac. We do this all the time. 
All women love to shop. All men are dogs. No, honey, your boyfriend's a dog. Right? This is the problem. We don't understand people. But, you know, I am 43 years old. I, I am from Detroit. Did, I am black. I did go to public my whole life. But I also played jazz as a kid. And I grew up swimming competitively from six years old all the way through, through high school. Right? I was an engineer undergrad. And I like to sail. These things shape the way I see the world. And because I see the world this way, I behave in the world a certain way. Demographics never get anywhere close to this. Right, but you guys are smart, right? You know this. Right, we got, we got, the hardware is what we see, the aesthetics we see on the outside. But what makes us run is the software, the codes that make up our day-to-day -day living. This microphone is going to give me a flux. The codes that make up our day-to-day -day living. And you guys are, you, you guys are sharp. You're like, of course, Marcus, I went to school. I studied marketing. That's why we focus on psychographics. Yes, psychographics are much better than demography. Demographics look at my age, my race, my gender, my household income. Psychographics look at my interests, my passions, what I like to do. And psychographics paint a far more vivid picture about who people are than demographics do. These are the forms by which we enter segmentation. How we take a population of people where every human being, every individual is unique, and we put them in boxes or we put them in, in clusters where they're more alike than they're not. Take a heterogeneous market where everyone's different and put them in homogeneous-like clusters. And the way by which we do this is we find ways that are identifiably different about who they are, identify them, but also something that is indicative of their behaviors, right? We may say, you know, we're, we're, we're going to target... Uh, we're going to target uh, millennials. Let's just say that, and I'm going to throw up a little bit of my mask. We're going to target millennials, right? And the idea is that, oh, we can identify millennials. We can say that person looks roughly this age. He or she is, a, or they is, are a millennial, right? But what does that tell us about their behavior? Not much. At the same time, we can't look outside and say, oh, that person's like a Coke drinker. She looks like a Pepsi drinker. We don't know those things, right? So the idea is that if we start with something identifiable, we want us to lead to something about what's indicative about their behavior. But if we start with behavior, we look for people who like pepperoni on their pizza arbitrarily, we got to find ways to identify who they are. That's what segmentation is all about. Who the people are, what they do. What they do, who they are. Right? The issue here, though, is that while psychographics help us better describe people, because demographics sucks at that, psychographics only tell us what people do, not why they do it. So therefore, we need a better way to describe people, but also get a better sense of causality. So how do you do that, Marcus? Well, it's actually a quite simple way that we know intuitively. It's our networks. Our networks of people. Our networks of people are the most accurate way to describe people and predict their behavior because we self-identify by our networks and we act in concert with our networks to promote social solidarity among ourselves, right? Our friends, our networks of people, our, our families, our networks of people, our coworkers, our networks of people, our classmates, it's a throwback, our networks of people. Right? Our fraternity brothers, sorority sisters, congregates, teammates, our people. We use these people to communicate to the world who we are, how we self-identify, and they also influence the behaviors that we take on because in each one of our networks are a set of characteristics, a system of beliefs, artifacts, ritual behavior, and language that govern what it means to be a part of these communities. There's beliefs that we hold. We see the world a certain way. There are artifacts that have meaning, right? There are ritual behavior, social norms that people like us do. And there's coded language that we use in the alchemy these four things make up our culture. And culture is the governing operating system of humanity, right? 
So Emil Durkheim referred to these things, beliefs, artifacts, behaviors, and language as cultural facts. Emil Durkheim being one of the founding fathers of sociology. And the thing is that our cultural facts, the beliefs, artifacts, behaviors, and language that we hold dear, they inform our psychographics. Our psychographics, what we like, our interests, our behaviors, they are byproducts of the cultures to which we subscribe. Right? I watch certain movies because of who I am. I eat at certain places because of how I've been reared to eat. I marry who I marry because of how I was raised. These things are all byproducts of who we are. Our networks of people become the anchor that informs all of our subsequent behavior, right? And in each one of our networks, our friends, our families, our teammates, fraternity brothers, sorority sisters, congregates, our, our work friends, our friends from, from, uh, from, our, our, from, from university, all of these people in each one of these groups, there are a set of cultural facts that govern what it means to be a part of each one, right? So take, for instance, I, I'm, I'm in the Collins family, it's Marcus Collins, so I'm in the Collins family. Right? And we believe family and church come first. It's what we believe. Therefore, on Sunday mornings, I'm in the church sanctuary. Or I get a passive-aggressive call from my mother that afternoon. She says, how was your morning, Marcus? That's how she gets down. Now, look, there were no stone tablets in our basement that I signed in blood saying I'm going to go to church on Sundays. It's just what we do. Right? These are the cultural facts of what it means to be the Collins, at least these Collinses. And therefore, I behave accordingly. Right. I'm also a member of the University of Michigan uh, uh, network, right? Both alumni and, and professor there now, right? We just happen to believe that we're the best school ever. It's just what we believe. It's debatable, I suppose. But there is one school that is certainly the worst school on the planet. That's just south of us. And if you went to school there, sorry, not sorry, they suck, right? And here's the thing, before I went to Michigan, like I didn't sign anything saying that I agree to hate Ohio State, even though I do, right? I'm not, I'm, there was none of that. In fact, I was pretty indifferent about Ohio State until I went there. But I hated Ohio State and now hate Ohio State because this is just what we do. These are the cultural facts. In every community you are a part of, every network that you are a part of, you had a set of cultural facts that govern what it means to be a part of these communities. And they inform every single thing you do on a day-to-day -day basis, whether you're aware of it or not. Sam Summers says it this way, that much of our daily lives are governed by norms and societal expectations that determine what is acceptable behavior for people like me. And we adhere to this behavior in an effort to maintain good standing citizenship inside these communities, whether we're aware of them or not. These cultural facts are the glue that ties our networks together. They're the covalent bonds that keep us close. And this is important. Because we as human beings, we are social animals, as Aristotle would say, right? That's why the idea of solitary confinement was like cruel, unusual punishment, because it pulls at the fabric of what it means to be human. And what happens when you break those rules of your, of your network? You gotta go, right? Your friend keeps doing the thing that we're not supposed to be doing. You go, I can't hang with her no more, because uh-uh, she, she, no, nah, she too brand new, right? And here's the thing, the brain processes social distress the same way we process physical harm, right? That is, our body manifests physical harm when we are at social odds with our people. That's why we use phrases like, it was a slap in the face when she insulted me, it was a punch in the gut, or he broke my heart. We manifest in these physical ways because that's how the brain cognates it. And since we are social animals by nature, in fact, anthropologists would argue that the only reason why mankind was able to survive or to, to evolve was our ability to socialize, to come together. So we do everything we can to connect. And we abide by this rubric every single day, whether we know it or not. I am a, we believe this, therefore I. I am a Collins. We believe family and church come first. Therefore, Sunday mornings, I'm in the church sanctuary. I'm a Michigan Wolverine. We believe Ohio State sucks. Therefore, every opportunity I have to defecate on Ohio State, I do it because they suck. Those are the facts. I don't make the rules. I don't make the rules. I don't make the rules. Right? This 
governs how we behave in the world. You know that saying in philosophy, I think, therefore I am? In this case, it's I am, therefore I do. And the same thing goes for every single one of us, even our consumers. We're governed by the social facts of what it means to be a part of our networks, our friends, our families, our teammates, fraternity brothers, sorority sisters, congregates, uh, political affiliations. All these things make up who we are. And because of who we are, we show up in the world accordingly. Right? So for me as a marketer, I, I, I don't focus on targeting demographics ever. Like it's like, how do we activate networks? Like that's the focus. How do we activate networks of people? And I love the way Jill Avery puts it. She says, our identities, these are the narratives we construct and negotiate with others, which identify the place we occupy in the social world in relationship to and demarcated by other people are created and confirmed through our social interactions. Who we are is a byproduct of our social institutions that govern what it means to be Marcus Collins or Daniel Cobb or every single one of you, right? And this isn't just, you know, marketing mumbo, mumbo jumbo. We also see this in network theory, right? So back in the day, a guy named uh, Cernoff, who was the, the CEO and president of the radio company of America, RCA, when they were just making uh, the, the radio broadcasting, he said, you know what? The value of the network is one-to-one -one related to the number of nodes associated with it. That is to say, the number of people who are watching your thing, like a broadcaster or listening to your podcast, the more people listen to your podcast, the more valuable it is. We know this when we think about television. The more people who watch uh, Comedy Central, the more valuable Comedy Central is as a network. Then later, a guy named uh, Metcalf said, well, yeah, that's interesting. But you know what's even more interesting? So we decentralize the network. We make it as such that people can connect with other people. When you decentralize the network, we allow for a greater value. And Metcalf is the guy who created the ethernet cable as, as we know it, right? Think about this like Airbnb. Instead of us all booking through the West End, which makes the West End a powerful network, Airbnb decentralizes so that you and I, I can, you can stay in my room and I stay in your room and I go, to, and I go wherever you're from, right? the value of this network becomes far greater than a broadcast network. Then a guy later, David Reed said, you know what's even better than that? Is that when you decentralize the network and people find people who are like themselves. And when people find people who are like themselves, the value of the network grows exponentially. Reed puts it this way, in a broadcast network, that's the Cernoff network, content is king. So sources compete for audiences based on the value of their content, right? This is like published content, television programs, products. In the Metcalf network, the stuff that is in, that, that's, tran, that, that's shared through tra transaction is king, email, money, services. However, in a group network, that's a Reed network, the central role is filled by jointly constructed values. We see the world similarly. And therefore, we behave in the world accordingly, right? Like this is this is empirical. The value of the network is greater when we connect with people who are like ourselves. For marketers, this is golden. We can broadcast all day long, but how do we help people find people who are like them and activate them? Not because of their demographic makeup, but because of their cultural affiliation, what they believe, the artifacts that are meaningful, the behaviors that are normative, and the language that we use, that is Superman powerful stuff. And it's all sitting out there for us. Right now, I, you know, I, I, I'm fortunate enough to like to, to teach and speak and work with like some really like high profile C CMOs and CEOs. And they almost always go, Oh, that's really nice, Marcus. Like, I, I like that, but like, oh, you don't understand what we do over here. We have tons and tons and tons and tons of data. And we take those tons and tons and tons of data and we put people in nice little boxes that we call uh, personas. And we, we write nice little paragraphs about who they are. We give them beautiful names, aspirers, cautious traditionals. I don't even know what the hell discriminating pragmatic is. But I know that no one looks in the mirror and say, 
I'm a comfortable progressive. No one does. And because no one self-identifies as such, there are no shared beliefs. There are no rituals. There are no artifacts. There are no language. This isn't real. And since we're talking about things not being real, let's talk about these guys for a moment. I know we're like way into Gen Z now. We were totally gotten over millennials. Those are so last year. But the same thing goes, right? So we have a mental picture of who millennials are. Like we have them in a box, millennials. They are self-entitled. They're narcissistic. Me, 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 me. They want it right now. They want to work for nothing. You know them freaking millennials. Lazy as all can be, entitled as all get out. Here's my favorite thing I saw about millennials. I saw this a, a couple years ago. I just use it all the time because it's perfect, right? Uh, millennials have officially ruined brunch. What does that even mean? Millennials are killing the corkscrew. Millennials are killing gyms, right? Millennials are killing the dinner date. Millennials are ruining the workforce. Millennials are responsible for everything horrible in the world. But what makes a millennial a millennial? Their age. And what is age? Not the age, but what is age? A demographic. There are 80 million millennials in the United States. You mean tell me they're all the same because they were born at the same time? That is the dumbest thing I've heard in my life. That is, quite frankly, stupid. Stupid. But we do it all the time. All moms are the same. No, they are not. Shoot, you ain't met my mama. Good night. I'm definitely different than my friend's mama. She let me go nowhere. I'm like, my friend, they, blah, blah, blah. mama said they can go there. Mama's like, I don't care. Right? Different. We put labels on them, but it doesn't make it real. And here's what I love the most, that every generation talks junk about the generation before them. Every single one. Oh, when I was your age, I had to walk barefoot to school 50 miles. Y'all got it so easy. What are you talking about? And we look at this like it's law. You know, those millennials, boomer, okay, boomer. It's ridiculous. It's quite ridiculous, right? Like, you know, people look at, you know, folks like the Migos and, you know, what's considered fashion today. They go, these guys out here wild. And look at these guys. And they, they're wearing, they look like idiots. Like idiots. And it's like, well, y'all remember those guys? <laughs> what are we talking about here, y'all? What are we talking about? It's the same thing. It seems obvious when someone points it out to you. But when it's not pointed out, we kind of go about it just because it's easy not because it's real. And we should be embarrassed by that as an industry because this is what we do. We have all the data in the world, but no proximity. All the information and no intimacy. This is problematic, right? And by the way, because no one introduces themselves or sees themselves, self-identifies as these markers that we put on them, None of this stuff is real. Like, I'm a black man, but guess what? When I look in the mirror, I don't go, Marcus, you're a black man. I don't feel black until I walk out of my door because the world makes me feel black, reminds me that I'm black. All right? But that's not how I self-identify. I self-identify by the beliefs, the ideologies that govern who I am. All right? Just because you put a label on it does not make it real. Just because we affix labels to things does not make it real. And I love the way uh, W.E.D. Du Bois puts it. He says this way, herein lies the tragedy of the age. Not that men are poor because all men know something about poverty. Not that men are wicked because who is good. Not that men are ignorant because what is truth. Nay, but that men know so little of men or mankind. We don't know people. And that's why the marketing sucks. We don't know people. That's why things just aren't working. We don't know people. And we have more tools and more data than ever before to reach people, to interrupt people, to interact with people. But we're bumbling fools when we go talk to them because we don't know who they are. All right. So the idea is that we have to, we have to deepen our understanding of who people are why they do what they do, understanding the underlying physics of how they cognate, which informs why they do what they do. 
right? And, and just you need just one more literature check here. Social groups are important to us. They serve to tell us who we are, our identity, what to think, how we cognate, what to believe, how to behave, social norms. And the more we value the social group, the more we are willing to be influenced by it. Our networks of people, our friends, our families, teammates, fraternity brothers, sorority sisters, congregates, our people. We use them to self-identify. They inform how we think, how we see the world, which ultimately informs how we behave in the world. Now, this is the, this is the, the crux here because we all wake up in the morning thinking that we make our own decisions. Wake up in the morning with this illusion of agency. You ain't making your own decisions. Our decisions are being made by our people. The things that are normal, the things that people like us do. And because of that, we take action as well. Right, the network theorist, uh, Chris Oxa Fowler said, our connections affect every aspect of our daily lives, exerting both subtle and dramatic influence over our choices, actions, thoughts, and feelings, and even our desires. We even see this done in the social physics of how things spread. Right, I'm gonna take you back to your, 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 your uh, stats class. I mean, a lot of you guys are marketers, so you probably didn't even take stats. But for those of you who remember, you probably slept through it. My man's like, yeah, I slept through the stats. So let me bring you back to this just quickly. Right, so a gentleman by the name of Carl Gauss, a uh, Ger German uh, mathematician, Carl Gauss, he revealed this idea that he called the Gaussian curve. And over like three centuries, four centuries almost, we've realized that everything in nature, every organic thing abides by this distribution. Everything, that is the height of people, our intellect, the, the height of trees, everything that is not man-made abides by this distribution. Right, it's, it's become so salient in our lives over the centuries in which this thing has been, been replicated that we actually call it the normal curve because everything normal abides by it, right? And for the statisticians, when the mean, the mode, and the median are equal, the, the curve is thought to be normal, right? And the taller the curve is, the more normal it is, right? The more we are to seeing it's the, the same thing. Now, enough of the stats. Let's talk about what this means, right? Normality happens in that middle, right? Most of the people are in the middle there, right? Where the normal parts are. But there's social pressures pushing you to be normal, to dress a certain way, to wear your hair a certain way, to talk a certain way, to go to school or don't go to school, marry this person, don't marry that person. All these things that we do Societal pressures are telling us to be normal because these things are aligned with our culture. So culture becomes this measurement of normality. It's normal. This is what we do around here, right? If I go out to shake your hand and you don't shake my hand, I go like, what's wrong with her? You gotta be like, oh, COVID, I got COVID. Like I gotta, I gotta somehow qualify it. Otherwise it's socially awkward or in some cases even offensive. And marketers know this so well about the middle being where the population is because that's where our sales funnel goes. Blast as many people as possible and hopefully we can convert a few of them. And we go there, why? Because everybody there, the market opportunity is huge there. I wanna be there because that's where everybody is. But because everybody's there, so is everybody else trying to talk to them. But what's happening over here? Oh, those are the subcultures. Those are things that are on the fray. They're, 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 they're fringe. They're on the fray of, of the population. No one's thinking about those guys. Those guys are crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy until it's cool. Crazy, crazy, crazy until it's cool. And when it becomes cool, everybody's doing it. Right? It begins to become adopted into the population and go from being fringe to being popular culture. What was once fringe becomes cool. Oh, 20 years ago, if you were uh, into comic books, that's, you were that guy. That's who you were 20 years ago. Now, the majority of movies that we watch across the globe all come from comic books. One of the biggest artists in the world is becoming a comic book hero. What was once fringe is now cool. Right, if you were into collecting collectibles 
20 years ago, that's the guy you were in people's minds. They're like, weirdo. Now collecting artifacts is cool. Once fringe, now cool. If you were into playing video games, this is who you were. Failure to launch in your mama's basement, right? Don't meet nobody. Be like, oh, girl, what are you into? He's really into video games. Up, oh, stop, cut bait. Now playing video games is cool. I mean, gaming is a multi-billion dollar industry. It was once fringe, now cool. If you told someone 10 years ago that you were paying $1,000 for a pair of sneakers, they say you are out of your mind. Now marketers use hype beast culture as a way to release new products. What was once fringe becomes reworked to be cool. That is super man powerful. If we start with the subcultural, it propagates to become the culture, the dominant culture. But the only way we understand these things is if we focus on people, real life human beings. So the question becomes, so how do we do this? Like, how is this achieved? Well, we gotta get a lot closer, much closer than we have been. We've been relying on data, this proxy between us and people to be sort of our, 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 our Sherpa to tell us about who people are, right? Tons and tons and tons and tons of data. Reams and reams and reams and reams of data. But our understanding of who these people are have not changed, right? And anytime I start talking about data, marketers go, whoa, 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 Marcus, whoa, 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 whoa. We got all the data we need here, buddy. We are stockpiled of data. I go, I know. We've had more data accumulated, accessed, and analyzed than ever before, than mankind has ever seen. Rapid, rapid growth of data. But our ability to extract insights from said data has only grown marginally. And what are insights? It's just converting fact into meaning. And our, our ability or lack of ability to convert data, information, facts into something meaningful is because we don't know who these people are. They said they like red, so make it red. Well, why they say like red? I don't know. They said make it red, so let's make it red. Then we go, they didn't buy it. We made it red. We don't know people. And marketers say this over and over again. They struggle to know who their consumer really is. Because we mistake information for intimacy. We think to have information on you that I know you. And these two things are not the same. Right? You go into a meeting, uh, you look at LinkedIn before you meet with the person, but you don't know who they are until you chop it up with them. Right? The same thing goes here. You, you meet someone on, on OkCupid, I guess that's what the kids use these days, uh, you know, on OkCupid, but you don't know that person until you go on the date. The same thing here. We have all the information, but none of the intimacy. Right? It's like, to me, it's like, uh, you know, I, again, I love that, Dan, I love that, that quote, Dan. It's like, you know, generality, correct, right? I could fly over New York City and I could see all the relationships between Central Park and meatpacking and Times Square and Murray Hill. I know I thought of Murray Hill, but whatever, right? Uh, I could see the relationships here, but you don't know the city until you walk the streets and you talk to people. In fact, you really don't know the city until you know how the city moves and what makes people move our culture, the operating system for, for humanity, right? So when we're studying culture and society, we're looking at one thing standing in for something else. We're observing a thing that's standing in for another thing. One philosopher uh, named uh, Calvin Brodus, also known as uh, Snoop Dogg, says this way, I keep a blue flag hanging on my backside, only on my left side, yeah, that's the Crip side. Now, if you don't know that Crip means, that, that blue means Crip, which is a gang affiliation, you see this guy wearing all this blue, you go, he's so color coordinated. And it seems kind of, you know, ridiculous that I'd say that, but a third of the country watched Snoop Dogg crip walking on stage and like, that guy really knows how to move. Like you don't understand the codes. If you don't understand the codes, you don't understand the people, which means we have to get much, much closer. So I, I'll show an example, and I'll run up on time here. So I, I, I'll show a quick example. Um, of our client McDonald's. So McDonald's is our client at, at Wyden, New York. 
uh, and McDonald's came to us and said, listen, we're battling so much hate right now. People hate us. This is about three years ago. And we said, yeah, you know, people definitely throw shots at McDonald's. But guys, like there are 100 million people that show up on your door every single day. A lot of people like you. So let's focus on them. You say, yeah, you're right. Let's focus on those folks. But we don't know who they are beyond their order, like who, who they are. So we decided to jump in a car and, and do an ethnography. We went to the heartland of, of the United States, not being swayed by the coasts. And see, like, what makes a McDonald's fan a McDonald's fan? Who are they? What are the, the, the social norms? What are the beliefs, the behaviors, the artifacts that govern who, who they are? So we went and talked to some real people in their cultural environment, right? Like a real ethnography, talking to people and realizing who, who they were. And out of that, we found what we call uh, fan truths, a book of fan truths that we learn. And if you're a McDonald's fan, some of these may ring very true to you. One, uh, your friend would take a fry even after they said they didn't want any. True. Big facts, especially my wife. Big facts. All right. Um, is there anyone out there that doesn't eat the bits of, of cheese that's stuck on the wrapper? If you don't, you're a monster. And you're lying if you don't. Right. Um, ordering tap water is taking and taking some soda is living life on the edge. Yeah. It's like, oh, just some water, please. <laughs> Sprite. The golden lights of midnight salvation. Late, 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 late night. And you go, oh man, nothing's open, but there's a golden arch. Like right? for these fans, those things were meaningful. Right. And one of the greatest fan truths was like, no matter how big you are, no matter how famous you are, everyone has an order. That's the democratization of McDonald's. If you put all of us in a room, we're in this room, and we none of us know each other, one thing we all have in common is that we all have McDonald's at one point. That's actually quite powerful. And we probably all have our go-to order. At least that's what the research revealed for us. So out of this, we decided to, well, let's remind America, remind the fans that we know who they are, we check it for them, and we decided to do this. So we kicked that off and said, that's super interesting. But it's like, well, let's make it real though, because we, 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 it's not, not enough to say it. Let's show it. So we decided to create a program that we called uh, Famous Orders or Famous Trades. We identified people who we knew were McDonald's fans, who had presented themselves as McDonald's fans, said, let's take your famous order and make it an actual menu item. And we decided to partner with this, uh, this, this little known artist named Travis Scott. So we launched this campaign in the, the, the Mar May of 2020, or maybe March of 2020, right? And completely crushed the game, right? Like completely crushed the game so much so that we broke the supply chain on for quarter pounders before the supply chain what, what was an issue. Right. And uh, uh, Wall Street said that we added 10 percent, uh, um, I mean, uh, 10 billion dollars of revenue to McDonald's market cap. Right? This is kind of kind of crazy. People are actually stealing the posters off McDonald's windows once the, the, the restaurants close. Completely crazy. So then we partnered with Jay Balvin, whose famous order was uh, a, a Big Mac and, and a vanilla shake. We partnered with BTS, whose famous order uh, was a 10 piece McNugget. They all share the one 10 piece of nugget. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, Sweetie, right? We partnered with her and her concoctions uh, that she makes. And then this in December, we did a partnership with Mariah Carey. And you may go, wait a minute, Mariah Carey, dude, come on. She's not a McDonald's fan. I go, uh, yeah, she is. Right? And this thing has been massive for McDonald's. Been massive for McDonald's. So much so that the competitors have even tried to, to catch on making like the Nelly meal. Come on, son, super lame. Right, but here's the idea here is that 
we didn't change the product at all. Nor did we talk about the value propositions of McDonald's. Nor did we talk about how fresh it is or any of the other things that the competitor set was doing in the category. Instead, we talked to fans like fans, identifying what are the cultural facts of what it means to be a McDonald's fan. And we just sort of kind of fanboyed out with them. And they felt like we were one of them because we understand who they were. It wasn't about the brand, it was about the community, the people and their beliefs, artifacts, behaviors, and, and language that govern what it means to be a part of these communities, their cultural facts, right? Which means you gotta see the world through their eyes, not yours. See the world through the eyes of the people that you're trying to activate, the real people, not the demographics or the boxes that you put them in. And I, I love this about Walt Disney, you know, in, in his day, you know, he would get on the ground when he played with kids to see the world as the kids do, to take on their perspective. I, mean, I love the way you said it. It's like, I love stories, man. I'm here to learn more about empathy. That's exactly what that is. Taking off your lenses is to put on someone else's lenses. So in the little time I have left, I'm gonna leave you with three things that I hope will be, will, will be helpful for you. The first, um, when we're watching people, you gotta watch with purpose. Or you gotta watch people with some intentionality. I also think that the best marketers, the best market researchers are comedians because they just watch people and they go, oh, that was kind of odd. You see what she did? Oh, he's doing it too. And they do it. Okay, this is a thing. It's a thing. And they observe it closely. Then they take theory to help dis define why that's happening. Then they find a way to interestingly communicate it to get on stage and say, he knows every time you go to the grocery store, you do this and you go, oh, it's so me. Of course it is, because they've been paying attention. And the idea of watching people with intentionality, with purpose, is you're not looking for answers, you're looking for questions. You're looking for, huh, that's odd. Hmm, that's interesting. Those questions then catalyze you to start looking even closer, to start unpacking who these people are. So first, look at purpose. The second is that why we look with purpose, we wanna ask why three times. Right? Remember, we're trying to get beyond the external expression, the blue flag that we see hanging on Snoop's backside and try to understand what's the meaning of said flag. Right? What's the translation? What does it say about who that person is? Beliefs, artifacts, behaviors, and language. Right? Moving beyond observation into meaning. So as we observe them, we ask why three times to help get out of our own bias. Because we can look at someone and go like, crazy, he crazy, she crazy. We do it all the time, right? You see someone with a, a, a MAGA hat on, and if you don't subscribe to that, you go, crazy. Or you see someone with a Black Lives Matter hat on, you go, radical, right? We got to move beyond our initial why that person's doing it. And then ask why again. And then ask why again. Typically, when we get to like the third why, we start getting to intentionality. So we look at people with intentionality to understand their intentions. And I, and I love this, this quote so much, is that you know, we judge ourselves by our intentions, we judge others by their actions. We're so easy for us to like, I didn't mean to do that, I wasn't trying to do that. Well, neither was that person. Right, but we don't give people the same amount of grace. Right, so first we look with purpose. The second we ask why three times. And the third is practice some empathy. Empathy, I mean, when you said that, I was just like lighting up, man, like empathy. I love that. And what is empathy? Empathy is the ability to take on other people's perspective, to see the world in a way that is not your own. Right, to take off your lenses and put on someone else's lenses. We often say, you know, walk a mile in someone's shoes, but that's not even enough. Like I could walk a mile in your shoes and experience what you experience, but I'm translating it through my own cultural frames. This is about seeing the world through someone else's cultural frames. Well, how do I know the cultural frames, Marcus? You gotta get close and understand who they truly are. You watch them with intentionality to understand their intentions. And once we do, we deny ourselves. We deny the instinct to say, oh, crazy, crazy, crazies. But take aside our lenses to put on other people's lenses to see the world the way they do. And the better we do that,
the more likely we are to see the world as they do. I hope this is helpful. At the very least, at the very, very least, I hope this forces you to see the world differently. Because when you see the world differently, the world will change as well. Now, we typically would have time for Q&A, but we're running a little behind. So I left my information for you if you ever want to get in touch, if you got questions. I also live here in the state, live in Ann Arbor. Um, so I'm around, I'm here. If you ever want to, to, to reach out, I'd love to hear from you. Love to answer questions as you have them. And thank you so much for having me.